You're listening to the New Hope Church Podcast. To learn more about what we're doing on the south side of Indianapolis, you can check us out online at becomehope.com. If you like what you're hearing here, be sure you check out one of our companion podcasts. We have a daily devotional podcast called Let's Find Out Together, as well as an apologetics podcast called Salty Saints. Let's listen in as today's talk comes from Randy Spade. Hey, everybody, you can be seated. My name is Randy. I'm one of the pastors here at New Hope. Thank you so much for coming and spending part of your busy day here with us as we worship the Lord. We're in the middle of a series here in the church called Ecclesia. It's the Greek word for the word church. We've seen that the church is called, the church is commissioned. Next week we're going to talk a little bit more about how the church is commissioned. And the church is a community today. We're going to kind of focus on the fact that the church is indeed a community. We're called to be together. In fact, that's the theme of a lot of the New Testament. If you have your Bibles, you can open them to Ephesians chapter 4. We're also going to throw the words up here on the screen. In Ephesians chapter 4, we see this. Paul says to the Ephesian church, Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord. Paul knows how to kind of hook them in and guilt them into listening, right? I'm in jail for you. I beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you've been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together in peace. Look at what Paul says there. He says that when it comes to how we treat each other, we should be humble. We should be gentle. We should be patient. We should be accepting. And he says when we treat each other this way, the result is unity and peace. Sounds great, doesn't it? The problem is doing it. Because we live in a broken world. And if everybody else would act just the way that I act, everything would be great. At least I'd be happy. The problem is everybody doesn't act the way I act. And when they don't, sometimes it makes me mad. And my first impulse is not gentleness (laughs) my first impulse is not patience I mean this passage is great obviously we should be doing this we want to be doing this we can even sit here this morning together each one of us here in this congregation focus on one person, ignoring everything else around them and say, yeah, I can do that. The problem is we leave here and then we get involved in real life. In getting involved in real life, things break down. So Paul tells us, what do you do? So how do you live this way? Humbleness, gentleness, patience acceptance. Well, to get started, he gives us a theological background. There's one body and one spirit, just you being called together to one glorious hope for the future. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and in all and living through all. At first glance, this doesn't appear to have anything to do with being a community. But what Paul's talking about is a mind 
shift. A change in the way we look at each other. A change in the way that we look at ourselves. A change in the way that we look at God. Now as you read through this passage, you see two repetitions. They sort of jump out at you, don't you? There is one body and and one spirit. There is one hope for the future, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. So we see that repetition, one. And we say, yeah, I get that. I get that. There are certain things that we have in common, that we share together. But doggone it, then Paul goes on and he says, this God is also the father of everybody, of all. And he is over everybody, over all of us. And he is in all of us. And he lives through each individual One and all. Paul says, yeah, there are certain things that we have in common. You see them here. One hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one spirit, one body. Certain things we have in common. But he finishes that passage up by saying that it's all of us together, each single individual with our individual quirks, our individual understandings, our individual struggles, and our individual different, distinct victories. God is over each individual. He's in each individual. Now, I think that what Paul is trying to get at here is that, yeah, we share some things, but at the same time, we are each different. We're different. Sometimes we think that other Christians ought to be exactly like we are, and we get frustrated when they aren't, when they live in a way that's different from the way that we live. No, we think they should be just like us. That's the path to unity. Paul says exactly the opposite. He says, oh no. It is not uniformity that's the sign of being a Christian. It's our unity in our diversity. We're different from each other. Thank God we're different from each other. But it's in that difference that we can show our unity. That's the mind shift that Paul wants to see in us. The fact that we can look at each other and say, you are different from me and I thank God for that difference. Because in being different together, we're more than I am on my own. Your differences help complete the body of Christ. Man, if the body of Christ were all like Randy, we'd be a mess. (laughs) But we're not. Where I struggle, you may have found victory. And you can see me struggling and you come to me and you say, hey, I went through that. Here's what I did. Let me pray for you. Our unity is expressed in our diversity. It's not uniformity that God is looking for. There are certain things that we do share 
There are certain things in common that we need to change and become like each other in that. But the vast majority of things, we are different and we're going to continue to be different. Some of us studied math in college, right? Uh, we have a certain way of looking at the world. Others of us studied art in science, in, in, in college, and we have a different way of looking at things. Some studied education, and they're looking at people. Others were engineers, and they look at things. We're different, and we need all of us to come together. It's as we come together in unity that we learn how to accept our differences. We learn how to accept each other and the differences that God has made in each one of us and celebrate that together. Paul goes on. He talks about our differences. He starts by exegeting a passage from the book of Psalms. He exegetes Psalm 68, 18. Now, he reads it from the Septuagint, and it says something like this. After you ascended on high, you led captive the captives, and you gave gifts to men. First, he talks about what it means to ascend. You can't ascend unless you first descended. He talks about that for a little bit. And then he talks about the gifts that God gave to men. And he says, now, these are the gifts that Christ gave to the church. And he names five. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors teachers. The gifts that God gave to the church are men and women. Men and women who have been put in leadership positions over us. And what do they do? Well, their responsibility is to equip us, God's people, to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we'll be mature in the Lord, measuring up the full and complete standard of Christ. Fantastic! Again, this sounds wonderful! But it breaks down as we come together and we start to work with each other. And one of those apostles or prophets or evangelists or pastors or teachers says something we don't like. So what do we do? Well, rarely do we go to that leader and say, tell me what you were talking about. I need to change. More frequently, we go to other people in the community. I didn't like that. Did you like that? You didn't like it either. Well, what are we going to do about that? And it might get to the point that we say, hey, you know what? I don't want to be a part of that community anymore. I'm going to find another community. Typically, I find a community that agrees with me more. So I have less change to make. This is hard. This is difficult. God calls us to change and he does it through the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers that he puts over us. Well, Paul goes on. He says, then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We'll not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth instead. We will speak the truth in love, growing in every way, more and more like Christ, who's the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts to grow. 
so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Again, we look at this and sounds wonderful, doesn't it? But it doesn't play out that way all the time. One of the reasons that I'm convinced that it doesn't play out that way, especially in our context, is because Americans as a people are hyper-individualistic. So when it comes to following the Lord, it's about me. Have you accepted Jesus as your personal Savior? Are you, as an individual, able to stand up against all of the resistance around you? Stand alone. Stand strong. Be an individual. Well, when we go to Scripture, we get an awful lot about doing it together, about doing it in community, about being part of a community, about us, not about me. <clears throat> we have come to a stage when it's easier to stay at home, grab a cup of coffee, turn on YouTube or Facebook and attend church. And I get it. There are times that we have to do that, whether for sickness or sometimes our jobs takes us away on Sunday morning and so we have to tune in later on during the week to be a part of this. But I do think that as Americans, it pleases us. It's easier for us to not be part of a community, to say what I'm doing, I'm doing because I want to do that. I want to encourage you. We need our community. It's important for us to be part of a local body. And by saying that, I'm not necessarily saying that we come to a church like this. That local body might be our house church. In the New Testament time, the church grew as house churches. There was not until about 250 years after the resurrection a building that was dedicated as a church. Up until that time, 250 years. It was house churches. That's how the church grew. That's where they came together. But that's the point. They came together. They formed a community. They were face to face. They could help each other. Whether that looks like a Bible study or whether that looks like a simple community or whether that looks like a Sunday morning church service. They were part of a community we need that. So what about those that would say, I'm part of the church, the big C church, but I really don't like the local church, so I don't go. And say three things to you. First of all, that's not logical. How can you be part of the big C church? if you avoid attending the local expression of church, again, whether that's a Bible study or a, or a simple community or a group like this, we need community. Secondly, I'd say it's not biblical. 
You read through the New Testament, and what do you see? You see letters written to churches. There are a couple of letters written to individuals, four in fact, but those letters written to those individuals, two to Timothy, one to Titus, one to Philemon, it was on how to act inside the church, how to lead the big C church, the gathering that was coming together. The third thing I'd say is if you want to be a Christian on your own, not attending a local church, it's just not healthy. We see here in this passage how God uses the community to help us grow. We need the community. My wife and I, we adopted two children before we had uh, two biological kids. The first one, Jeremy. We had submitted our paperwork and they called us and they said, we have a child here who is going to die unless he's placed with a family. He is suffering from a syndrome called failure to thrive. What that means is in the uh, orphanage where he was, there were many people that would come by and when he was crying, pick him up. This person, then that person, then the other person. When he cried because he was hungry, sometimes this person would feed him, sometimes that person. And as a result, he didn't bond with anyone. And he was literally dying at two and a half months old. He weighed less than 10 pounds. He had not grown since birth. They said, we fear that if we don't put him with a family, he will die. We took him and he began to put on a pound a week until today he weighs around 280. Somewhere in there, you know, things kind of got out of hand. <laughs> no, he's just a big boy. He's an offensive lineman. Offensive line football coach today. But the point is, we need community. As Christians, when we don't get involved in a community, we can suffer from failure to thrive. And we can die spiritually. We need our community. Now let's take a look again at those five types of leaders that God gave us. He gave us gifts as a church. They're the apostles. They're the innovators, the ones that are always looking for a new way to communicate the old message. The prophets, they speak truth to us. Whether it's truth from a pulpit or whether it's sitting around a cup of coffee. The evangelists, they're the recruiters. They go out and they win people. The pastors, they're the caregivers. When we're down, we call them, and it helps. The teachers, they're the trainers. They open up God's word, and it helps us see and understand. These are not the only gifts that are mentioned in the New Testament. There are two more lists. Romans chapter 12 talks about the prophet, the servant, the teacher, the encourager the giver, the leader, and the friend. Being a friend is a spiritual gift. 1 Corinthians 12, we see God-given wisdom, God-given messages, God-given faith, God-given healing, God-given miracles, God-given prophecy, God-given discernment, God-given tongues, and God-given interpretation. And these aren't the only thing that God uses. We have natural talents, inclinations that God uses. Hospitality, music, all of these God can use. Some of us working with children, many, many others. It's as we discover our gift and begin to use it, 
that we begin to grow in the Lord and we can help others to grow too. Now here too is a problem. How do we figure out what gift we have? Well, when I was about 11 years old, I accepted the Lord in a, at that time they called them revival meetings. And there was a speaker that, that evening, his name was Stanley Tim. And uh, when he gave the invitation, I went forward to talk to him. He sat down with me. I was the only one that night. He probably thought, hmm, this was a, this was a failure, just one little 11-year-old kid comes. But he took time. He, he showed me from Scripture what it meant to be saved, what I needed to do, and I got involved. I, I tried to do it, and I didn't do it perfectly. I was a teenager. I grew a little bit, and I fell a lot. But when I became an adult, I decided, okay, I need to get serious about this. And in my mind, the way to get serious was to imitate the person that had been instrumental in leading me to the Lord. I wanted to become like Stanley Tam. Now, Stanley was an evangelist. He was an evangelist on steroids. He would share the gospel with anybody and everybody, and people would come to the Lord. He was also a businessman. He kept records. One year he kept records, and he saw that that year he had led 365 people to the Lord. And he thought, wow, that's one a day. And he said, if I can do one a day, I can do two a day. And so he began to pray that the Lord would use him to bring two people every day to the Lord. And within a couple of years in his record keeping, he saw that he had led two people to the Lord every day. And he said, wow, if I can do two, I can do three. And he began to pray. And sure enough, a couple of years later, as he tabulated the people who came to the Lord, he saw that on average, three people a day came to the Lord. That's an evangelist. That was not me. I'd try to do what I thought Stanley would do, and I'd, I'd talk to people, and I swear I drove more people away than came to the Lord. And I was frustrated. I figured, okay, I'm just not doing it right. So I studied and I tried to learn how to do it, and nothing helped. Well, by now, I was a missionary in Colombia. Being a missionary, I thought, if I can't do it here, I'll do it there. Well, guess what? Whatever you can't do here, you're not going to be able to do there. <laughs> but I got down there and I met a guy, and he helped me discover my gift. My gift is not the gift of evangelism. I'm a teacher encourager. The way encouragement is expressed in my life is in discipleship. I meet with a few and just try to help them grow. I try to pour everything that I have into them. And I'm a teacher. I love to study God's word and I love to share God's word. And I've had people say, that helped. Okay, okay. As I understood my gift, I began to grow. Others around me began to grow. I don't know what your gift is. But you need to figure it out. You need to find it and use it because that's what happens in community. We share together, we come together, and we grow together. So, 
When will the church be unified? It'll be unified when we use our gifts. According to this passage, it'll be unified when we do the work. I do want to draw your attention to that. He talks about the gifts that he's given the church, the leaders, and then he says explicitly, the leaders are not supposed to do his work in the world. The leaders are supposed to prepare us as we go out and do his work in the world. We don't look to the pastor and say, hey, I got a friend who needs to know Jesus. I'd like you to come talk to him. The pastor will help you figure out what to say as you go talk to him. Hey, pastor, uh, we've got some homeless people over here. I think the church ought to. If the Lord is showing you a need, it's not because he wants you to try to tell somebody else what that need is. It's because he wants you to be involved in fulfilling that need. What's your gift? When we do the work, we become more like Christ. We use our gifts. And we use our gifts inside the body and outside the body as well. Now, I do want to say one thing here. I am not an evangelist. That does not mean that I don't evangelize. Because we are all commanded to evangelize. Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. That wasn't just for Peter. That's really for all of us. Some of us are going to have supernatural power when we do that. And it's really going to sink in. Others of us, like me, are going to struggle. But we're going to keep on doing it. Because as my father said, even a blind hog finds an acorn once in a while. We're going to keep on doing it. The evangelist? Oh, man. It's going to be dozens and dozens. Me, you know, it might be two, three a year. But I'm going to keep on trying because we're commanded to do that. We're commanded to serve. We're commanded to encourage. We all need to be doing that. We're commanded to give. We're commanded to be friends. Some of us, because of our gifts, will have a particular Good time as we do that. And finally, we will be unified as a church when we speak the truth in love with each other. One of the reasons that we are in community together is because iron sharpens iron. As we come together and we get involved with each other in small communities, in small groups especially, we find that others become aware of our weaknesses. And they can help. They can pray for us. Sometimes they've been through those weaknesses themselves. And they will speak truth to us. But when they do, they'll speak the truth in love. We need the honesty that comes from being together in a local community. That honesty will bring us to have difficult conversations with each other. When we're in the middle of that difficult conversation, we've got to get, let love guide us. That's the interesting thing about speaking the truth in love. It's both sides of the coin. The truth, yeah, there's something that we need to be doing. But we communicate to that, that to each other in a loving manner. It's both grace and truth. So what are we saying? Just summarizing this morning. Jump in. If you want to see unity come to this body, get involved. Jump in. Find something to do. 
whether that's something inside the church or something outside the church. Find a way to use your gift. There's so many opportunities here. Kidmen, we're constantly looking for volunteers. People that'll come, not necessarily to teach. You don't have to teach in Kidmen. You just have to basically shepherd a child or a couple of kids. We have English language learning. You know what you need to be involved in English language learning? A desire to help somebody. That's it. We meet twice a week, in the morning or in the evening. It's about an hour and a half each time. Get involved. Talk to Nancy. Nancy, raise your hand so people know who to see right there. Go talk to her. She can let you know what's involved in being a tutor for an English language learner. We have Children of Hope, our preschool ministry. Now, you don't have to be a teacher. You don't even have to be an aide. You could be. You know, one of the things that we need? Readers. People who would come and at the end of each day around 2 o'clock, they read a story to a class. And there are teachers there to make sure the kids are sitting and if a child gets unruly, they'll grab that child and just whip the... No. <laughs> they know what to do. They'll take the child. They'll extract him from uh, the situation and let you keep on reading. Man, if you love being a grandparent, come and read to our children of hope outside the church. There are as many possible needs as there are neighbors surrounding us. Get involved. Tell somebody in the church what you're doing and let them come help you. Maybe they need a fence painted. Maybe they need a lawn mowed. Maybe it's a homeless person who needs a meal. I don't know. Be creative. Look around. Figure out what pleases you as you get involved in helping someone else. That's probably your gift. Do your gift. They all require time and effort. Not a single one of these things just happens. We've got to be intentional. Jump in. Be intentional. So we come to the end of our time in the last several months. We've had some questions to kind of help you hone in on what it is that the Lord's saying to you this morning. This morning, I'd start with this question. What has God been saying to you about getting involved? Many times it's the needs that we see around us. That's the indication here. When we see a need sometimes, I'd say usually, it's because God is bringing that to your mind because you have the gift to be able to respond to that. So what has God been saying to you about getting involved? Who can you pray with about this? Is there anyone here that you need to talk to that might be able to hook you up with some resources or with other people who might be interested in the same thing? Who are you going to talk to? When are you going to talk to them? Pray with me, please. Lord Jesus, we want to be your community. We want to be a community that's known for reaching 
the needs of those who surround us. Not in a flashy way. It's not about that. It's about you. Help us, Lord. Show us the needs that are around us. And show us how we can be part of the answer to those needs. I ask this, Lord, in your name. Amen. Thanks for tuning in to the New Hope Church podcast. If you would do us a favor and like or subscribe on your favorite platform, we would really appreciate it. Also, if you happen to have any questions, feel free to reach out to us at questions at becomehope.com. Have a great week and know that we are praying for you as you seek to be Jesus in every corner of your world.